and and Dr. Nelson is an award-winning chemist recognized by the American Chemical Society. But his uh, how I got to know him, and I don't know everything about you, Dr. Nelson, so you can fill in the blanks, but he started a company called Paratech Pharmaceuticals out of, was it Watertown, Massachusetts? But anyway, a suburb of Boston. Boston. Out of Boston. Chinatown, yeah. Boston, right across from the great restaurants. Oh, so yeah, yeah, I've been, I've, sure, I've, had, sure. I've had many a, a, a fish with head on it in uh, in those restaurants. But so Paratech, you partnered with Wally Gilbert, who's a Nobel Prize winning chemist from Harvard, and created a robust chemistry. But the only problem is the pharmaceutical industry wants statin drugs, which are antibiotics, by the way, but they're not telling you they are. They're on patent, whereas tetracyclines, not not sexy and some of the tetracyclines that already exist like oh they're going to become sexy again tom go on yeah i i'm all <laughs> i'm all for it so then <laughs> then mark went to uh, frontier scientific where me and uh, this dr burke worked with uh, jerry bomber the chief scientist there to develop this sono photodynamic therapy so that's how mark and i got in many discussions and then we realized that at frontier you know, his real knowledge was in tetracyclines and Dr. Trump, my mentor, would use minocycline and biaxin, minocycline being the tetracycline, lipophilic tetracycline, to treat glaucoma and, and neurodegenerative conditions. And so Mark and I have had many, many conversations about tetracycline chemistry and how many people in the world carry on tetracycline conversations with you, Mark? Not too many. That's why we developed a friendship. Um, but if you want to fill in any of the gaps that I left in terms of your background and then proceed to tell us a little bit about what's how tetracyclines are going to become sexy again. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, I'm, all, yeah. I'm all ears. All right, let me begin. First off, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania and I got a, a bachelor's degree from Gannon University and I went on and got a PhD at Temple University in Philly in medicinal chemistry and organic synthesis. And back then I was doing drug design in, in anti-inflammatory compounds from a Chinese herb, right? But one day I was watching uh, a, a, a Nova show called When Wonder Drugs Don't Work. And I'm trained as a microbiologist as well, too, by the way. I worked in microbiology when I was in college. And I saw that people weren't working on tetracyclines. And so then I met a fellow by the name of Stuart Levy out of Tufts Medical School. He was a professor MD oncologist, by the way, who went into antibiotic resistance. And so I started to look at different types of, uh, so I, actually I joined his group as the first chemist and we were looking at, oh, the Chinese herb is uh, uh, tetramethylpyrazine, the goosterine wallachi, it's called. Anyway, uh, tetramethylpyrazine, by the way, just to back up, is a potent antiplatelet agent. And so when I started studying platelet pharmacology, I realized that inflammation was big, right? So anyway, in Boston, they threw me into a lab. They gave me a lab in the chemistry department. When I opened the door, it was totally devoid of any kind of glassware. It was all been stolen by the grad students. And I basically said, you know, I think everybody, anybody else would have ran out screaming, but I said, oh, I'm going to build this up. And so I built a lab with Stuart Levy and we started to make new tetracycline derivatives. Now remember, this is like 1987 and people were like, oh, antibiotics are so old. We got all we want. And in that show, Wonder Drugs Don't Work, Stuart Levy was one of the first ones to point out that antibiotic resistance is a problem. And so it kind of opened up the door for people to do research in the area again. And our first funders were Pfizer, and uh, in my lab, we started making compounds with Pfizer, and that was in 1990, 91. Mark, I want, so I'm going to interrupt you for a second because there's a preconceived notion that all antibiotics are the same, you know, because everybody worries about gut disruption. But I tell people that if they're all the same, we'd only need one. Right. There's a huge number, like 250 or more antibiotics that are commercially or available through any kind of pharmacopoeia at this point. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, why don't I share a screen? I can show you guys some pictures too. How's that? Let me make sure I have given, <clears throat> you, given you that right. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let me, where did it go? 
Well, anyway, you know, antibiotics, Tom is right. And there's different families of them. You have the beta lactams. Those are, you know, uh, work against penicillin binding proteins. And those are really small molecules. Um, this one, am I sharing this? You guys you should, see be able to, you should be able to share now, but we haven't seen it yet. All right, hang on a minute. I'm kind of fumbling around here. What's that at? Hang on a minute. It's not calling up the share screen. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, let me go down to this slide. Can you see a picture of a got two guys on the screen? Yep, we're good. Uh, all the, right. Let, let me tell you a story. Now. All right. Robert Woodward from Harvard. Yes, I'm Harvard. Harvard. Yeah. All right. So, you know, by the way, you know, antibiotics have been around for a long time. And as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I found out that and I did research in this area with an anthropologist, and I'll tell you about it later, that actually the ancient Nubians were making tetracycline liquors back, oh, about 2,000 years ago. But I won't, I won't go back that far because everybody knows the story of Alexander Fleming and his mold and the fungus and penicillin was discovered by him. But, you know, in reality, it wasn't. Uh, other tribes, other people... Uh, earlier peoples were making gruels with antibiotics in them, and I proved that. I'll tell you about that later. But in any case, after penicillin was discovered, there was a big race in the pharmaceutical industry. They're like, wow, this is great. Everybody's making money. And so the next company to get into it was a company called American, uh, or actually what they called American Cyanamid. And so it was this fellow, Benjamin Duggar, who discovered areomycin, and that was from a soil bacterium that was plucked out of the soil in Columbia, Missouri. Anyway, he discovered the first tetracycline. And this is 1947. And remember, back then, all they had was, they had, uh, um, um, well, they had penicillin and they had streptomycin. But then they had tetracycline. And tetracycline was so potent against rickettsial diseases like Rocky Mountain spotted fever that they put it on the market even before they knew what the chemical structure was. And that, that's unlikely, you know, but it was so good at saving people's lives. Anyway, this is 1947 and Benjamin Duggar was, he was the hero. By the way, he was 80 some years old when he discovered it. So, you know, you're never too old to make a major discovery. So Benjamin, he's kind of my hero here. Anyway, R.B. Woodward was the guy from Harvard who actually proved the chemical structure and, and what happened was it set off a whole series of contentious lawsuits and congressional hearings. And, and, and so Pfizer and American uh, uh, home products or whatever they call letterly back then or American cyanamide, it, it, the tetracyclines funded their growth and expansion because they were such great drugs. So just let me show some chemical structures here. The natural products are made by the soil bacteria. I mean, uh, I show them here at the top. There's chlorotetracycline from Duggar, oxytet from Pfizer, tetracycline also from Pfizer. And then the chemists started to get creative and they would chemically modify them. And so that's where I found that this was a wonderful place to be as far as chemistry goes. So in 1967, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but doxycycline was discovered and then minocycline as well. And so everybody knows those two drugs, fibromycin and minocin is now big. And so they're great drugs. They were second generation drugs and people made a lot of money off of it and saved a lot of lives. And they started to study all types of different uh, activities of them. People found that they were anti-inflammatory and that certain diseases were, were uh, ameliorated by using doxycycline or minocycline. And again, this is starting in the 60s and 70s. And, um, but in our case, you know, we were studying the antibiotic world. This is a ribosome here in the center. And basically what tetracyclines do is they just block protein synthesis in a bacterial ribosome. And, and that's their mechanism of action. So that's all good for the antibiotic world. So in any case, you know, infectious disease, I don't need to go into that, but, you know, people die from infectious disease all the time. It's unfortunate, but bacteria basically want to feast on you. And that's the reason for uh, that we develop antibiotics is to stop that from happening. 
And so back in the 90s, when I was working with Stuart, you know, there were some people that were excited by that. And Pfizer was again, because they were the masters in it. There were other people working in it. Uh, um, Letterly was back into it back in the early 90s. And, and, but, but it's really difficult chemistry. It, it takes a lot of time and effort to try to make new derivatives that you can patent. So, you know, back then, all these different, different, you know, uh, commercial entities were trying to scare us. The end of miracle drugs, the new apocalypse was, was being parlayed at people. It hasn't happened yet, but back then, people didn't know. You know, I mean, look what happened with, uh, with the pandemic. But basically, what you have to worry about are these uh, multi-resistant bacterial pathogens like Staphylococcus, you know, TB, Mycobacterium. Um, Asinetobacter is a big problem, especially in the military. It infects people's eyes, and it's just a, it's a terrible pathogen. And then there's Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a, a gram negative that's really hard to kill, mainly because it's so resistant to all types of different antibiotics. It's like a superbug. These are all superbugs in uh, the different strains. So when I got involved, I was working on efflux pumps and bacteria, and basically they're like revolving doors in bacteria. The drug goes in, it gets spit right back out. And that's how I started with Stuart. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and what we started to do was make compounds that could in, inhibit bacterial efflux. And there's other mutations in the ribosome of bacteria that, that cause resistance in, 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 against antibiotics. So in this case, you know, Wyeth came out in 2006 with Tigacil. You may uh, see that on the market. You may be prescri prescribed that. It's, it's not orally active. Uh, Professor Meyer's group at Harvard University more recently has made a couple thousand derivatives based on total synthesis. Uh, it's not doing so well. And then our compound at Paratech Pharmaceuticals, I realized needed to be synthesized because it was just a big gap in, in, in the chemistry. And I don't want to go into that, but what we were doing is looking at this efflux pump inhibition story. And again, as we knocked out uh, uh, these efflux pumps, the antibiotics got more potent. And that's a good thing because, um, well, you want to have potent antibiotics. What, what is the efflux pump? Oh, they're called MEX, oh, excuse me, the, the tech family of pumps. And so basically what happens is, is it decreases the concentration of the antibiotic within the cell. And so the bacteria can survive to another day. So I don't want to get too much into the chemistry, but here's the tetracycline ring system. It's A, B, C, D rings, and they have numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six. This upper periphery between four and, and nine is important. These are the areas that we can modify to make better drugs. And so that's what I did when we started Paratech Pharmaceuticals back in 1996. Anyway, without going into the chemistry and the efflux point, I'm just going to jump through that. Um, this has to do with here we added uh, an inhibitor and it caused an increase in tetracycline to stay within the cell. And that's an important thing is that because once you knock out those efflux pumps, it makes the bacteria susceptible. And that's, that, that's the, 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 uh, the key here is making the anti antibiotic work against bacteria at a concentration that the bug can uh, not get rid of. So in this case, we studied all this. And, you know, I don't want to go into this chemistry, but we started to modify different parts of this ring, C7 and C9. These are the positions that we modified. I did all kinds of chemistry. I had 23 chemists in downtown Boston, right across from Tufts, and we built Paratech Pharmaceuticals there, and we made over 3,000 derivatives uh, in Chinatown. Again, more chemistry and even more chemistry, but, uh, you know, again, as we made these compounds, we started to study them in different models, okay? So against bacteria, we, we started to see that Nuzira or the, uh, our amino methyl series was really potent. But at the same time, there was a whole area of science that was, that was growing in the, in the non-antibiotic uses of the text. And so I'll jump into that in a minute, but I just want to finish the antibiotic story because it's so uh, important here because actually it funded 
my understanding of the non-antibiotic tetracyclines. And so what I mean by non-antibiotic tetracyclines is as we chemically change the structure, the compounds were either antibiotics or they didn't work. And when they didn't work, we use those to study their effects in animal models of inflammation. And so in Chinatown, Boston, you know, Wally Gilbert was a Nobel laureate. He brought in his clout and we, we raised hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, when we started to build Paratech out, I said, we have to have a vivarium and we need to be able to study the tetracyclines in all these non-antibiotic uses. And that includes inflammation and in, in inhibition of certain uh, inflammatory enzymes called matrix metalloproteases, as well as neurodegeneration. Because there were people from the SUNY Stony Brook College, Lauren Golub and Bob Greenwald, who, who were friends of mine now, and, and but they were studying minocycling against inflammatory processes. And I, find, I found that amazing. And so I jumped in the car one day and I went up to uh, 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 Long Island to a conference. And I'm like, geez, I wonder how many people are going to be there, five, six, at this conference on uh, in inflammation and tetracyclines. There were 350 people there studying tetracyclines in mammalian disease states. And I was like, wow, this is really great. And so I, I got up and I gave a little soliloquy because I was the only chemist in the room, but I started to understand that, that these people were on to something. And that's where I got involved in the whole inflammatory aspect of tetracyclines. And it's really cool because where I'm at today with it is way uh, different than where I was with it when we first started Paratech. So here we had this vibarium. We had New Zyra as an antibiotic. By the way, let me tell you a story about be, being in a pharmaceutical, starting a pharmaceutical company. It's a roller coaster ride of emotions and periods of wealth and periods of, 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 of poverty. And I will tell you that the, the amount of poverty that we saw was pretty striking. Uh, we almost ran out of money two or three times. The first time we tested New Zyra in a, in a, in a, in a Staphylococcus aureus model, it didn't work. And we're like, geez, that didn't work. Why is that? So then when I said, you got to go back and do this again. And they did it again and it still didn't work. But yet the values in a test tube were so great. And then the third time was a charm because finally they got the animal model to work in this staff model of animals. And uh, sure enough, it worked. And that saved that drug from being lost. Anyway, but this is what happens. You know, research isn't always cut and dry and it, takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, and uh, but we were into it. I mean, by that time we had had Nuzera. So basically, you know, uh, Nuzera is a minocycling derivative, and here's a picture of minocycling. It has a, a, a nitrogen and these two carbons off of the nitrogen. That's what makes mino a really good drug. It makes mino able to cross into certain biological compartments to fight an infection as well as cross your blood brain barrier to get into your brain to fight different uh, uh, problems, or I should say infections or, or inflammation. Uh, Tigacil here on the left is, was the Wyeth Pfizer drug now. And this compound is not orally active. You have to have it injected. It has to go in IV. And it's just, you know, they still sell 600 to $800 million worth. Our compound, um, uh, this amino methylcycline from Paratech is, is potent by itself as an oral drug and currently is uh, marketed by, the, by Paratech. And you know we sold $150 million worth of it last year, as well as to the government because it works against anthrax. And so our government our, uh, has purchased a quarter billion dollars worth to put in a strategic national stockpile. And so I'm pretty proud of that because we started, you know, I sat in a meeting and I said, hey, this works against bacillus. We should be testing this against anthrax. Uh, you can't use anthrax in Boston, uh, but you can hire people to study it. And we started that 15 years ago, and it's moving to the point where if there's an anthrax attack, it'll be uh, available. But in any case, 
you know, we started to look at all these different molecules and I'm not going to go into all the different pharmacokinetics and how it works in the animals, but it started to look really good and it got tissue penetration. And that's, that's a big deal is tissue penetration by an antibiotic. Um, in 2018 though, it got approved. Ticacil, uh, oh, excuse me, in 2005, 2006, for all these different um, um, indications against bacteria, but it never had any use as an anti-inflammatory drug. And people have looked at it, but it's not that good. And I'm gonna show you something later in, in more recent research that I've been doing with a startup that we, that we just created. Any case, this is the chemistry. You know, I, I'm not gonna go into the chemistry. My chemists, uh, you know, are, are, they're probably still having nightmares about it because it, the, 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 the chemistry of tetracyclines is really, really hard. And that's what keep, kept people out of it. And the reason it's hard, and I'm just gonna point out this, if you can see my cursor, all these oxygens and this OH group, this whole area right here makes it really dynamic. And I'm not going to go into it, but one molecule has different substructures. And if I calculate the number of substructures, one molecule of tetracyclines has 64 different isoforms or di different, different forms because of this lower periphery, they call it. It's almost like a, a, a digital computer, okay? It has different shapes and forms depending on its environment. And that's what makes the tetracyclines so cool is that they're unpredictable and they're hard to chemically modify, but I've, I've been doing this for 30 years. So, you know. Mark, I, back in chemistry, we had the chair and the boat configuration. So you had, those were two configurations and that's, that's right. Out of, that's out of the C6 configuration. So you're talking about 64. That's a huge difference. It is. And it has to do with what's called keto enol tautomerism between these groups. In other words, this could be a double bond or it can be one of these. So they change, they're chameleons. Yeah, they rotate. The electrons just float around and there's, there's some changes yeah. in oxidation and reduction of the different ones, but the net molecule stays the same. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that... Nobody expected that. And, and, you know, computational chemists in Germany study this kind of phenomenon with these molecules. And, and I, I've talked to them and worked with them and published on it with them. And it's like, geez, you know, you guys are really, and, and they, it, it's, it's really an interesting molecule. I hate that, you know, it's almost like a molecule has gained the ability to, to, uh, 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 to move, to co-locate. And, and by the way, these, lower hydroxy groups in these oxygens bind really, really heavily to calcium and magnesium. And that's a big deal. And, and I'll explain why when I get into mammalian uh, inflammatory processes that we're studying. Anyway, this is old chemistry. This is on the market. Uh, this is some of the activity against staph and strep, and it had really potent activity. Here's, here's our drug number six. You see it was all in green. These are in micrograms per milliliter. So the lower the number, the better. And so here you see it was really potent against resistant bacteria. And uh, that's what made Nuzira uh, king of what it is today. And that is on the market. So I'm not going to get into a lot of the uh, drug design aspects, but we did do a lot of work in animal efficacy of this molecule. Uh, we did all types of uh, comparisons between this and other drugs. And we studied this compound and its half-life, how long it lasts after an IV dose, as well as an oral dose. And so, you know, it was a, uh, it was destined to happen. But I can tell you because of the nature of being in a pharma business, it almost disappeared in 2011 again. And that was when in 2009, Paratech, like everybody else was running out of money Things were bad in the economy, and in 2011, I had to let all the chemists go. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, the, the company almost went under. Luckily, because of a hedge fund guy by the name of Seth Klarman, he's one of the biggest hedge fund guys in Boston. He saw the value in it, and he put in the money to keep Paratech afloat. And they finished uh, the clinical studies phase three. And to this day, I haven't met Seth Klarman, but boy, I'd like to, I'd have to shake his head because this molecule almost, uh, 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 like I said, disappeared. 
And as far as that antibiotic goes, we can't afford that as a society, as a, as a, as a, as human beings. Uh, the more antibiotics we have, the better. Any case, bromatocycline is really potent against streptococcus, so it's approved for um, um, community-acquired pneumonia now. And it also works against all types of different bacteria. So uh, a lot better than currently used drugs. And it really works well against uh, gram-negative pathogens. And it's got good pharmac uh, pharmacokinetics in humans. So with that, uh, it's finally approved. And I was happy about that. But, you know, I invented this drug back in 2001, you know, and it took a long time to get this drug on the market, but if you need it, it'll help you. And so it's got plenty of clinical efficacy against pathogens and- Mark, go back go? one, because the one, the one that they hear from me a lot is chlamydia pneumonia, and that was on the bottom of the list. So- Oh, just... yeah, yeah, let's go back down here. Tetracyclines are really active against chlamydia. And, you know, chlamydia being what it is, it, um, you know, it needs to be further studied. But how would you tell, how would you characterize Mino, Doxy, and uh, Amada in terms of its activity against chlamydia? Uh, Doxy is the least. I think Mino's better than Doxy. I'd have to go back to the literature and check that. I, I agree, by the way, yeah. And whether or not people are using, you know, Omada cycling for chlamydia uh, remains to be seen. All right. So, by the way, you know, I, I, I also study intracellular pathogens, and I'll show you some data later, because a lot of these chlamydial infections tend to be uh, behind hidden bio compartments, whether they're intracellular or in lipid-like environments. And so developing a drug against chlamydia, um, well, let me tell you how the pharma industry views this. When they come up with a drug as an antibiotic, they want the biggest market possible so they can make the most money, okay? And so when they go and they look at the activity against chlamydia, it's always after the fact. Sure. They, they optimize the activity of, we optimize the activity of amatocycline against what are called escape pathogens, E. coli, strep, Klebsiella, you know, uh, acinetobacter, pseudomonas, enterococci, escape, right? Those are all the ones you see in the hospital all the time, but they don't, I should say, we didn't um, um, modify the activity to reflect activity against chlamydia. They don't do that, but that's the way that should be done is you, have, you increase the activity. Any case, that's a good, good point, Tom. So uh, safety, you know, it monocycling's approved for cab P and and, and complicated skin and structured tissue infections, and uh, it's doing well. But here's the proof of the pudding. This poor fellow had a, a big wheel here. This was at intake. Look at the size of the infection. After three days of Nuzera, it cleared up. And after one month, it's gone. So hallelujah, the drug works. So that was the conclusion, um, you know, as far as the antibiotic stuff goes. In 2019, me and my chemist got the Heroes of Chemistry Award out of this, and uh, I was pretty proud of that. Where is, I thought I had a picture of my colleagues here. Ah, no, I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to go to a new file. I'm going to jump around a bit. It's time to switch over, because you've heard the antibiotic story. That's good. Now I want to go in and talk about, can you see this? Not yet. All right, still fumbling around. Where's the share screen? Oh, here we go. So let me give you a, just a little synopsis of the anti-inflammatory activity story. And so in this case, again, I'm kind of just going backwards, but tetracyclines have a long medical history since 1947. By the way, 1947 is a pretty pivotal year. Did you know that that was the year Stephen King was born? And that was also the year of the Roswell uh, crash of the aliens that they uh, figured. So 
you know, some people say, how I was, was, I was on that flight, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, a lot of weird stuff happened in 1947. But again, Duggar discovered areomycin. I showed you his picture. You know, doxycycline and minocycline came up. Uh, in my case, I joined uh, the Levy Lab in 1987. We formed Paratech in 96. Wyeth had Ticasil approved. We were in phase one by then. And then in 2018, Zyra was approved. Okay, this is the antibiotic history. But let me switch gears and talk about. Oops, where am I going? Let me talk about um, um, the non-antibiotic history. So all this anti-inflammation activity was observed in the late 1940s. The minute it came out, they started to say, "Oh, well, these things are working as an anti-inflammatory." But it took Golub use uh, in his research in 1983 out of SUNY Stony Brook that they found out that it inhibit collagenase, minocycline. Collagenase is an enzyme that breaks down collagen. You don't want that in your body. You want healthy collagen. In any case, him and Greenwald started working together and Bob, being a rheumatoid arthrologist, discovered the rheumatoid arthrology, uh, uh, the RA anti-activity. And so it worked out great. So they pushed doxycycline as a matrix metalloprotease inhibitor for gingivitis. Larry Gollum was a dentist researcher. So when you get you know, inflammation in your gums, your body expresses matrix metalloproteases as a, as a evolutionary artifact. So that, you know, back before we had antibiotics, if you got a toothache when you were running around the savannah, you know, a couple million years ago or whatever it was, you know, your MMPs would cause your abscess tooth to fall out. And that's what, how people lived, I guess. Any case, the matrix metalloproteases um, um, were found to be inhibited by doxycycline. And so doxycycline was the first FDA approved matrix metalloprotease. Now, you know, pharma has been trying to inhibit that enzyme for decades and the road to ruin and pharma hell is paved with uh, companies trying to inhibit MMPs. So then, you know, this was an era of inflammation study of minocycline and doxycycline. And, and that's where Tom got involved. What, what year did you start working on, on mino? And what did you notice doxy and mino? Well, you know, Dr. Trump was using minocyc minocycline. I now have to call it minocycline because you're the world expert, but I've always called it minnow. But he was using minocycline for the MMP reductase activity in, in the probably mid-90s. And then he used uh, biaxin to uh, downregulate nuclear factor kappa beta. And nice. the combination is, uh, you know, and, and, and we wrote a patent on this. So I think mino does more than just downregulate the MMP inflammatory pathway, but that's the key one. Nice. Well, you know, so it's, it's, again, you know, when I walked into that room in Long Island and there was 350 people in there and I started talking about making new derivatives because, you know, Mino was already uh, being, Mino, Mino, was already being used. It's, in, it's Mino, you're the guy. <laughs> Mino cycling for now. Listen, I, I hack everything, so it doesn't, I guess it doesn't <laughs> matter. But in any case, um, you know, for some reason they made me the, the, the the heir apparent to trying to find new derivatives of new compounds. And so, you know, at Paratech, we, we had our own vivarium, as I said, and we studied non-antibiotic tetracyclines in everything from um, LPS-induced multiple sclerosis, and we found compounds that work. These compounds did not modify bacteria or stop their growth, but they work really well in multiple sclerosis. Then we had a program in rheumatoid uh, arthritis, and that compound worked well too. We studied compounds against different inflammatory diseases, and they all worked well. We did try to study stroke, and it didn't work out well, but I'm going to change the tune on that in a minute. Because in 19, oh, what year is it? Oh, in 2008, I get a phone call from a guy named Mark Halterman, a neurologist out of uh, Rochester. And he's like, I'd like to test some of your compounds in a stroke model. And I'm like, that's fine. We just went through a whole stroke model. It didn't work. But him being the diligent fellow that he was, 
we found activity of certain compounds in stroke. And I want to show you that data. So hang on a second. Let me switch gears again. Oh, let me go back. So, so in any case, where I'm at is we're looking at different aspects of the tetracyclines. And from years of me looking at antibacterial agents and their effects in inflammation, uh, there's four major fronts that I'm involved in right now. So first off, there's uh, uh, M3 therapeutics, and I'm going to talk about stroke and immune activation and how the tetracyclines modify stroke. And we have animal data to support that. The second area that I'm involved in is with a fellow out of EPFL in Switzerland named Johan Auerts. He's Mr. Mitochondria. And Andy Dillon, who's a biogerontologist out of, uh, uh, out of Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And we're studying tetracyclines that modify virus uh, reactions. Then the third area I'm involved in is using tetracyclines for uh, ophthalmic inflammation in AMD. And I have data to show you there too. And then finally, I've been looking at drugs that uh, affect neglected diseases. And what I'm looking at is, um, um, well, different tropical diseases. I can go into that. And what we find is that we can change and remove uh, and selectively remove parasites and uh, it's ongoing. So let me tell you about M3 Therapeutics, okay? Because while we were looking at the antibiotics, we found that certain antibiotics um, had potent activity against stroke. And so with Mark Halterman at, at University of Rochester, we were funded by the DOD to make uh, tetracyclines that treat acute stroke and cardiac arrest and post ischemic neurodegeneration. That means if you lose oxygen to your brain, um, your body sets up reparative or reparative mechanisms to fight that. The first thing that happens is it sends out signals to your spleen into your systemic uh, blood and it turns on your, your neutrophils and the neutrophils get activated. They go through your lung, they get primed with oxygen, and then they rush up to the part of the brain that is damaged by stroke and they cause further damage. And so in this case, you see on the right here, is we, here's a cerebral cortex that has injury and it's outlined here in white. And so this is after a stroke. And these little green dots are neutrophils, macrophage, that infiltrate. And you can see that they go in there and they cause further damage, which is uh, indicative, and they stain it with a MAP2 uh, containing uh, dye. In any case, you can see in the outline the area of the damage. In our case, we started to give them different drugs. And what we saw was that uh, there was no brain damage. Sure, the, the neutrophils and the macrophage could still get in and infiltrate, but they didn't cause that damage. And so basically, they rescued the animals from stroke. So in this case, here's, a, here, here's three different mouse brains. The one on the left is a sham. And you see that after we cause a stroke, uh, uh, this is just a, a, a control, excuse me, and there's no damage at all. However, if we occlude a artery in, a, in the brain of a mouse and give it LPS, you see the brain damage here outlined in red. When we dose it with a drug called uh, M3T2165, and this is a novel tetracycline, it doesn't have antibiotic activity, but what we see is that you don't get brain damage and it stops the stroke from happening. And in this case, what we theorize is that the tetracyclines are, are, are knocking down different uh, activities. So in this case, we measured um, um, reaction oxygen species, the drug decreased it. It decreased the ability of, of the neutrophage, or excuse me, neutrophils to get in and cause damage, and that was decreased as well. So these, these tetracyclines 
that are mo chemically modified stop stroke from happening, and they do so by, by inhibiting damaging immune cells. And we proved that uh, several several. Is there, is there a way, way to measure microglial cells activity? Yes, there is, as a matter of fact. And so uh, there's, um, um, I, I don't remember the exact in vitro mechanisms of it, but I'd be happy to take a look at it for you, Tom. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering if that was uh, measured in these mouse models as well. Uh-huh. Um, let me pull up the exact, here, I can show you some more data. Thought I had it, let's see where's it at. Oh, right here. So, you know, the compounds inhibit, in this case, TNF alpha production and also CD11B activation on the cell surface, as yep. well as decreased free radical formation. Can you see this? No. Okay. Oh, there it is. There we go. I didn't want to go down. I didn't want to take everybody down a pretty deep rabbit hole, but I was just curious. Well, let, let me put it this way. You don't want CD11 activation. You don't want free radical formation. And these drugs knock it down, okay? And, and the TNF alpha production. So, you know, basically what these drugs are doing is that they're, you know, once you have inflammation set up. It's only available for a limited time. Go to getrefunds.com. Yeah, so, so once you have, once you activate your macrophage, uh, it's all over. But these compounds kind of like throw ice water on the macrophage and put them in a, into a quiescent state. So again, there's the brain. Which brain would you rather have? I'd want the one on M3G, uh, 2165 after a stroke. So that was kind of the story. And with M3, we started M3 about two or three years ago, although Mark Halterman and I have been working together for 10 years on this. Um, but we think that there's other ways that, that the M3 compounds can be used. And that includes hypoxia and fetal hypoxia. You know, people worry about pump head and ventilation hypoxia. Well, you know, tetracyclines have all shown activity against pump head and fetal hypoxia. It's just that they use minocycline and they use doxycycline and those are antibiotics and I think medicine's kind of worried about setting up super infections, although I don't think it's really the kind of, a, uh, it, it could happen. The other area that tetracyclines work are spinal cord injuries. And because again, that's another form of hypoxia. You break a spinal cord, uh, the cells die. And then there's a, the possibility of sepsis due to pulmonary and abdominal infections, you know? So, so I gotta tell you, here I am working with Mark Halterman, we're studying stroke. And let me go to a different story because there's a fellow in, there's a fellow out of EPFL in Switzerland who studies mitochondria. His name is Johan Alwerks. He's the Nestle chairman of, of molecular biology at EPFL. And he started MitoBridge. And so, you know, 20 years ago, I said to my biologist in Boston, I said, we need to study the effect of tetracyclines against mitochondria. And they're like, why? And I said, because mitochondria and rickettsial disease, well, they're both alpha proteobacter. I don't know if you knew this, but, um, you know, alpha proteobacter, like rickettsial diseases, are biologically related to your mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And so the interesting part was that, you know, your mitochondria being alpha proteobacter, well, they, they sense tetracyclines the same way. And so when I met Johan, it was because he found that doxycycline um, increased the lifespan of, of, of a worm model. And, you know, longevity research is really big these days. And so he was the first guy in 2015 to come, come out and say doxycycline uh, causes these issues with mitochondria. You got to be careful. And so, so I, I contacted them and we said, 
know, so okay. So when Johan jumped in, oh, my interconnect, uh, my connection's getting unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah, you kind of went out a little bit. Thirty seconds. Yeah. Okay. Any case, we started to look at the the process of what's called mitohormesis. And this is a, an immune response to infection. And so when, when your body is hit by an infection, it causes mitochondrial stress. And ideally, you want mitohormesis to occur. That makes your mitochondria more healthy. And, and what they found was that a low-level interferon response, you know, your, your, your immune system makes interferons, uh, helps you survive and tolerate the disease. So if you get a disease, instead of being susceptible and killed, you know, certain low levels of interferon will induce mitohermesis and tolerance to a disease. And so two years ago, we started, two and a half years ago during COVID, we started this project and we started to look at tetracyclines against mitochondria. And so that's where I'm at now is that we started looking at the mitochondrial and, and how the mitochondria interact with your cell nucleus. And then we found that tetracyclines can induce mitohormesis, which is a healthy, healthy mitochondria. And so in this case, we did the same kind of chemistry in biology. And we looked at these molecules that target mitochondria they induce healthy mitochondria, the mitohormesis. They don't affect bacteria and they're orally act safe and of course patentable. So, so let me show you this worm model, right? There's a, there's a process in your mitochondria called the unfolded protein response. And basically when you activate the unfolded protein response, the worms shown here as glowing blue blobs get more and more colored. And what we found with one compound we called C2, the compounds were exceedingly potent uh, compared to doxycycline and tigacil and nuzera. And so these compounds were non-antibacterial. And here's C2's activity. It doesn't have any antibacterial activity but it works really well in increasing the longevity of this worm model. Now, I know humans aren't worms, but they use the worm model, uh, Canorhabditis elegans, because it's the simplest model for studying longevity. And so we started to screen all kinds of molecules. Here's doxycycline. Can you see this? It, it lights it up a little bit, showing a healthier response of the mitochondria. Mitocycline, it didn't really hit the mitohermesis button, and Nuzira didn't either, although certain other tetracyclines did. We looked at doxycycline and a compound that we called C9. It turned on this unfolded protein response. And so furthermore, this unfolded protein response in mitochondria is needed. When you have a backup of unfolded proteins, you're in a toxic state in your cell and that's not good so what these what these tetracyclines are doing doxy and, and minocycline they're they're increasing this upr and so it's making your mitochondria healthier and that's an important thing so in any case we started studying these molecules and again in the worm model c elegans we found out that they turned on the the mitochondrial stress response and the type one interferon response to low levels, which means it's kind of like a chemical exercise. The tetracyclines are stimulating your mitochondria to get in shape because they're being, they're being um, um, taxed by a, a, this unfolded protein response. So then we found, and again, this is all out of uh, EPFL, that once you stimulate these these interferons at a low level, it's part of the mitohormetic response. You're making everything healthy. And you know, by the way, your mitochondria take up 25% of the volume of your cells. And nobody expected this of the tetracyclines. So in our case, we started to study these things 
in inflammatory responses to viral infections. And two years ago, when COVID first started, we started to look at this response in H1N1, and we set up a research collaboration in Wuhan, China, which is the center of viral research for China. I think we all knew that, right? Any case, these compounds, these non-antibiotic tetracyclines have the potential uh, to treat mitochondrial disease, neurogenerative disease, Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, this, this hypoxic injury I was talking about, and in an acute kidney injury, as well as immunometabolism. And so we started to study these molecules. And uh, I think we know, or I think maybe Tom has told people that the tetracyclines have found activity in Alzheimer's disease. And so we've been studying that. And that model is going forward. These are three or four month studies, but so far the compounds we're putting into it show activity. And again, all being done at Wuxi Aptek in Wuhan, China. Uh, we're studying compounds against mitochondrial disease. And so that's ongoing. And we're studying different autoimmune diseases. And so basically the tetracyclines are acting at the level of the mitochondria to stop the inflammatory processes that cause things like cytokine production and the cytokine storms that occur. And uh, that's a big deal. So where are we at now? Here's, here's what happens when you give our compounds to an animal that has a virus infection, H1N1, upon preventative. It stops and ameliorates this whole infection cycle and it saves the animals. So then we wanted to see how did it work upon a therapeutic administration? Previously, those assays were done where we gave the drug, infected them with virus and saw how it worked. Now we give the drug after they're infected. And again, what we see is that the clinical scores of the animals with our drug rescue it from death as well as, um, um, well, being debilitated from the virus infection. So our tetracyclines, you know, once the mouse is infected, the tetracyclines are going in and shutting down the immune response uh, um, and saving the animal. And it has nothing to do with an antiviral effect or changing the microbiome of the, of the animal, the, the, the inherent bacteria in the gut. Then we found out, and this is new, Tom, you're going to like this, that our compounds reduce inflammation and they, re, they boost lung regeneration. In this case, what we find is that they correct uh, the pathology of lung damage. So here our compound is, here's the infected, but here's what happens. And it's a, a better score and shows that these our compounds collect, uh, uh, correct ciliopathies. And so this is unknown before in, in the history of the tetracyclines. You know, there's a, there's a paper published by uh, Amange out of Stanford, 2003. And I use the title all the time. Inflammatory blockade restores neurogenesis. Yeah. And the whole, the whole concept there was they were looking at, you know, the, the side effects of cranial radiation on brain degradation. And so what did they use in their, in their model? Lipopolysaccharide. Sure. That so basically they're using too. bacteria as the stimulator of inflammation. Yeah, and, and you know, that's been how people run these assays in animals since time immortal, right? Yeah, and the, and the biggest problem we have in medicine today, I was just listening to Mercola um, interviewing, who was he interviewing? Oh, uh, here, Corey. And they, 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 they just both agree that there's a, there's this huge gap in infectious disease for an understanding of, uh, you know, we have acute and chronic diseases, but we only have acute back, only have acute infection, you right. know, which is which is abs which is absurd because they they both titrate to each other, so you can't have one without the other, pretty much, and uh, just no infectious disease. I've been in so many contentious arguments with with traditional infectious disease doctors that I just I just ignore that now, but. 
but it's the <laughs> low-grade inflammation that escalates in a log linear way that's the biggest problem we have and COVID taught us that because it's not the virus it's the cytokine storm and yeah. Dr. Dr. Carter and I actually wrote a paper that was published in 2020 on that very topic well that's pretty cool well you know uh, I, I, I in the infectious disease world I have a problem with that okay um, <laughs> um, yeah like for instance you know you know you give somebody a beta lactam and it destroys the cell and those contents leak into the cell. I mean, leak, leak into the body and cause an inflammation. It has to. Is it in the literature? No. I mean, there's a couple people that said, oh, maybe this happens. But, you know, with the tetracyclines, they, they don't cause cell lysis. They don't cause a cell to break up and disseminate, you know, lipopolysaccharides and, and all the different, you know, lipids that cause inflammation. And, you know, it's, it's I don't know. I'm not knocking the in, in infectious disease folks because they're, you know, I'm one of their brethren, but I'm also outspoken about it. But so. but there's a difference between acute and chronic, and you don't treat a chronic infection with a tetracycline for 10 days. You could. You could. No, but I mean, you probably won't get the results you want because the way they hide, right. the way you mentioned very early on, you have to have a therapeutic dose within the cell in order to wipe these things out. And then, you know, the work of Charles Stratton, which I know you're aware of, talked about the elementary body, the reticulate body, and then the intermediary body. And these things can go hide in like the biofilms. And so you may not have complete penetration. So you have to wait until they come out. And that's then, true. Yeah, that's true. You know, uh, so, so where was I there? Uh, I think I lost my train of thought there. But that's, right, right. Back. <laughs> that's all right. I don't know. Still morning here where I'm at. Um, yeah. what, what slide was I on? Okay, so so anyway, these compounds reduce inflammation in mammalian cells. That's all there is to it. And they also collect or correct ciliopathies in your lung. And nobody expected that. And so uh, we formed Tiberius Therapeutics recently, and we're trying to raise money for that and M3. I don't know. It's, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm in it for the long run. I'd love to come out with a new tetracycline for these mammalian cell uh, neurodegeneration properties. And right. so there's a lot of science behind uh, uh, the disease of inflammation in young people versus age and risk uh, patients. I don't want to go into that, but our molecules may be able to go in and change uh, acute respiratory, respiratory disease disorders and stop you from dying. And so, you know, we're looking at uh, viral pneumonia right now in an animal model and still going on. Uh, and we're looking at uh, all types of different, you know, disease states like Alzheimer's disease because of the, the, the fact that the tetracyclines also affect the neurodegeneration, neuroinflammatory pathways. So, you know, it's a lot, a lot going on with the tets. Um, just to finish this off, I just want to share this and go to the end here because I just want to point out some some people that were instrumental in getting this done you know with New Zera, I don't know could you see this mm -hmm. me in the lab with my uh, uh, my colleague Mohammed Ishmael all right he was like the last guy to get out of Somalia alive him and I invented New Zera. He, him and I worked on that problem for a year and a half and uh, we're happy to say that we got that to work and uh, with who's that, the who was the young guy who was left? You know, uh, some guy. I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> we don't know. Uh, I'm still the same age, you know, in my mind. Yeah. Uh, don't <laughs> ask me why. But with that, you know, Mohammed. I, I promised Mohammed. I said, Mohammed, if we get a drug on the market, you and I are going to get the Heroes of Chem American Chemical Society Heroes of Chemistry Award. And that's us. Three years ago, prior to the pandemic, by the way, the last people to really have show up and get a, get get the meeting. But, you know, when we got nominated, like, oh, it was just you and another person or two, right? I said, no, no, no. I said, there were 14 of us. And so here's six of the people that were involved. And we got this, it was like the, it was like the United Nations of Chemistry with Paratech. Everybody from all over the world, Somalia, and India, and, you know, Ireland, and, you know, everywhere. We all got together and we, uh, well, you guys ever see the movie um, um, uh, 
um, the Clint Eastwood one, where he steals the gold from the Nazis. And, you know, it was the same kind of story. We brought all these people together and, and, and we, we got the gold because we all brought something to it. And we got the award for that. But Mohammed and I are, you know, we're still tight. We're still talking about making new compounds. And that's where we're at. So here's all the different effects of the tetracyclines and inflammation-based uh, uh, disease states. I mean, it's active in fragile X, in multiple sclerosis, microglial effects, cytokine effects, arterial sclerotic effects. You know, if you look at the history uh, at clintrial.gov, you know, 50% of the clinical trials for minocycline are for non-infectious disease. Look at all the diseases people are studying minocycline for now. There's 257. Half of them are for non-infectious diseases. What's going on? Doxycycline is the same way. You know, it's, it's, it's good in cardio protection and ischemia and myocardial infarction, you know? So... Take your tetracyclines, folks. That's all I can say. They're great. They're great drugs. I, I have a solution, Mark. It was a brilliant presentation. I have a solution for everybody to take a tetracycline. I know Dr. Carter's cringing, waiting to hear what I have to say. <laughs> but it's the same thing I always say. Now that I saw the presentation by Dr. Nelson, what is the best way to get tetracycline? Go to Indiana and eat dirt. Sure, Terra Hot. Yeah, that's what I was just there. I was just in Bloomington. So I'm going to, I'm not going to eat dirt in my backyard anymore, which I do on a frequent basis. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Bloomington, which is close enough to Terre Haute. Cause I go there frequently and, and eat some of their dirt, get some of the natural tetracyclines. Sure. Mark, have you sense. heard of the, the a question about the biologics? And my presumption is a lot of them just downregulate TNF alpha. Um, there's a paper by Clark and Bissell from you from the Australia. And, and it took me a long time to figure out that, you know, the anti-inflammation is a, a huge important leg in these uh, inflammatory pathways and neurodegenerative conditions and even just basic conditions like heart disease. So going after inflammation is important. And I think, you know, I think it became more apparent to the world with COVID, with the the discussion of the cytokine storm, not just the virus. But mm -hmm. th these guys wrote the paper, The Meteorology of Cytokine Storms and the Clinical Usefulness of This Knowledge. And they're pushing the biologics as just down-regulating down TNF-alpha. And I think that's insufficient to treat some of these neurological conditions. Any yeah, I would agree. No, I would agree. I mean, listen, you know, doxycycline and minocycline are just two molecules out there that can treat these things and we were talking about phytonutrients earlier and and those there's a lot of molecules in the phytonutrient world that also treat neurodegeneration absolutely so i, met, so I mentioned johan Auerks, okay a u w e r x should look him up uh he's a, he's an amazing guy and his claim he got started studying molecules out of pomegranate juice that modify the same unfolded protein response. Mm -hmm. And so they stimulate the same kind of pathway as the tetracyclines. It's a natural product, you know, uh, extraordinaire. And, uh, you know, it's just a good place to start. Until, until my drugs become available, go buy some Palm Wonderful, folks, and drink four or five ounces a day. It's, it palm, knocks down palm, inflammation. You call it Palm Wonderful? The Palm, yeah, pomegranate juice. Yeah, if you want to save money, go find a Mediterranean grocery store. They sell it much, much cheaper. Yeah, I had a I had a pomegranate based um, um, kombucha two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. So you know Not all these natural out. products that stimulate your mitochondria to become healthy is an important thing. Well, sunlight, and, infrared light, is, plays a huge role in that too. Well, a question. You know, I got a question for you, Mark. So sure. on the Minocycline, what dose would you say? Because if you don't want it to have the antibacterial effects, then and more, yeah, of a all you know, yeah. let, let me tell you a story. You know, there's the dose makes the activity. Okay. Right. And so doxycycline was approved as an MMP inhibitor at 20 milligrams per day. Okay. Mm. Okay. And so when I was hanging around all these, these biologists, I kept wondering, how come if they give more drug, 
it, it doesn't get better. Usually if you give more drug, mm -hmm. the, the condition gets better. Right. In this case, as they gave more drug, it became worse. Yeah. So there's a low dose of doxycycline of a tetracycline. And, and we saw that in our studies with the H1N1 virus. As we went to higher doses, it didn't get any better. It was the lower doses that worked. Okay. But yet 20 years ago, uh, so so you could, if you gave yourself 20 milligrams of a tetracycline a day, you, you would be fine. You won't hmm. set up a super infection and it'll stimulate your unfolded protein response and clear out those damaged proteins that, that are backed up in your mitochondria and, and make them healthier. So, so doxycycline versus minocycline or uh, either? You know, they're, to, to me, they're the same. Oh, um, gotcha. Yeah. You know, you know, minocycline is the more lipophilic doxy, more uh, um, hydrophilic. So, you know, that it probably, maybe you do 20 of each or 10 of each or something like that. But mm. I, I want to ask you a question about uh, COPD because I have someone that I started on, sometimes when we're going antibiotic, we do dose escalation just to avoid a, a big herx. But this gentleman, I recall doing about one eighth the dose. So, you know, um, uh, 25, 25 milligrams. And he had a very, very severe reaction. And then we did more terrain treatment. And then he started again at, I think, um, 124th the dose and is slowly working up to the range where he had the major Herx reaction. Um, what I did testing upside down and backwards. They didn't do a periomics or fry, but what organisms do you think are associated with COPD and what's the best treatment for them? Well, COPD is probably, it's probably my polymicrobial, where there's many different bacteria because your lungs are always inhabited by many different bacteria. And mm -hmm. so the question is, is which one is uh, causing the problem? You know, is it an inflammatory response to antigens in the lung? Because they, you know, all of your neutrophils get primed in your lung when they rush up and they get oxygenated. So, you know, if that's part of it and which antibiotic would you give? Well, I, I, I just showed you the data where uh, where the tetracyclines correct uh, inflammatory lung damage. Mm. So would you give doxycycline uh, for chronically? Yes, you could give minocycline chronically. Or what, what, you what about your what about your new one that I don't know the nickname of yet? What, Nuzira? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I haven't seen any activity on that. You know, we we haven't studied it, but. I can tell you that when it comes to mitohermesis, Nuzira and Tigacil did not work. So what does that mean? It means that, that simpler tetracyclines are exquisite modulators of mitochondria. They're not the ones that we make, you know, they're simpler. Now, when you, say you're taking it, when you say you're taking this chronically, you, daily for how long? Oh, I, I know people that have been on low dose doxycycline for months and and even doxycycline for months because of certain infections, gotcha. bone infections and everything else. Okay. So, you know, there's, there's certain liabilities. You know, doxycycline has one set of liabilities, photosensitivity. Medicine yeah. has another set. You know, they often, some people are susceptible to, to, to dizziness and in, in nausea and all that, you know, yeah. you guys, you the, guys biggest, know the biggest concern our population has is wiping out the microbiome. And I always tell them, you know, the lipophilic one, the minocycline, it most yeah. likely doesn't have a lot of dwell time in the gut. The, the worst thing I've heard from people, an occasional UTI, but I don't, like I took minocycline and roxithromycin for 18 months. This was before a good understanding of the microbiome, and I never did anything for my gut. I never had a problem. Um, but, you know, Someone said, can I take this on leaky gut? The answer is, don't start taking something like this on a leaky gut. Fix leaky gut. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, fix, fix what you can first and then do a probiotic regimen, no matter what the antibiotic is, no matter how safe we think it is towards a microbiome. But I'll let um, Mark, uh, Dr. Nelson, talk about what, he's, what his sense is on these tetracyclines on the robustness of the microbiome. Well, I'll tell you, uh, doxy and mino will affect the microbiome at higher concentrations, okay? 
Uh, the derivatives that I study with Johan and Mark Halteman, they don't affect the microbiome. We've done stuff. We just published a paper on that, and it didn't even touch the microbiome in the gut. And so, but you know, when you compare a minocycline, a monocycline to a broad spectrum antibiotic, there's a big difference in how it affects the gut as well. It's all in a continuum. Is is that a false statement? But from no, my no, experience, that, it's not. No, it's not. I mean, you know, hey, listen, as we age, everything gets leakier. Okay. Your blood brain barrier gets leakier. You know, your, I'm sure your gut gets leakier because things just naturally break down. Um, and, and that's the difference between an aged mouse population that you study versus a young mouse population that you study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so there's all kinds of, you know, there's, let me put it this way. There's things that we just don't know, right? Uh, like for instance, Bob Moore, uh, Robert Moore, who worked with Rudy Tanzi, at MGH, he passed away recently, by the way, of glioblastoma, but he was on the forefront of studying the, the blood brain barrier leakiness of different populations. And when I met him a couple of years ago, prior to uh, COVID, we were going to work together and study tetracyclines with him and Rudy. And uh, he sat there for four hours and told me all about the work he was doing, studying different bacteria that crossed membranes uh, due to age. And as you age, different bacteria can, 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 can mo uh, uh, mobilize and colonize you know, your brain. And, and to your point, Dr. Nelson, the, the thing on the unfolded protein response, he showed that the unfolded protein response was actually an innate immune response. That's right. Um, um, antimicrobial peptide to some degree. Yeah, he was studying LL37, which is a, a brain peptide, a human peptide, as well as A-beta and all that, you know? Now I know where Dr. Carter might have mentioned shockwave to you, because... Yeah, uh, it, it enhances LL37. Chocolate does? Yeah. Well, our, our device does. Choc chocolate does. <laughs> no, chocolate. Because endorphins will do that as well, but no. Um, shockwave. Shock, the shockwave technology. Oh, shockwave. I'm sorry. I, I missed that. I was thinking chocolate because I, I know uh, one of the premier studiers or cardiologists who study chocolate back at yeah. UC San Diego. Anyway, anyway. And then, and then I'm also, you know, peptide certified. So that's one of the peptides that, um, well, it's plus or minus to get it now. Um, but prior to COVID, um, I could prescribe LL37 um, from a couple of the uh, compounding pharmacies. But guess what? It works for COVID, and really, FDA came in and shut it down. Oh, well, that's too bad. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Especially when you, it's, you may know, not, you may not have an answer to this one, but someone asked about low dose naltrexone as an anti-inflammatory versus the tetracyclines. Do you know what the pathway for LDN in terms of an anti-inflammatory? Naltrexone, the the anti-opiate. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Low, low dose. So low dose. Well, yeah. listen, you know, people have been climbing around ivermectin. People have been studying hydroxychloroquine and, and chloroquine. You know, the minute COVID came out, I looked up uh, hydroxychloroquine. And by the way, you know, I've studied the non-antibiotic properties of other compounds, or I should say the antibiotic properties as well. There, there's, there's plenty of compounds that are anti-inflammatory. You know, hydroxychloroquine is anti-inflammatory. It's got 3,000 publications alone uh, on its anti-inflammatory activity. How does it work? Does it work by mitohermesis? Nobody's pointed that out. Does it work by stimulating mitochondria? Nobody's pointed that out. Um, you know, there's plenty of things that are anti-inflammatory. And when you're dealing with a, a, you know, a global virus infection, the more anti-inflammatory activity, the better. Yeah. Now, are, are, are these molecules working by a receptor base or receptor mediated activity, or are they perturbing membranes and just slowing the inflammatory cascades down? We'll take it. Uh, well, yeah, you know, whatever LDN, it is. Yeah. You know, the LDN works kind of like what you're what you were just describing with the uh, the tetracycline molecule. So it's an immune system modulator. Yeah. So at you know, up to about 4.5 milligrams. And, right. you, you know, cause I'm, I'm on it. I've been on it for several years and, um, and it, it also works for COVID, you know? Um, but yes, that definitely, 
um, has been proven to be quite instrumental in a whole host of disease syndromes. Now, everyone can't take it, um, even at that low dose, because it, it, it does cause insomnia in some people and can, can cause vivid dreams um, in the first two weeks. But it usually abates in the in first two weeks and so forth. But I've had some people that can't even tolerate it at all. But I prescribe it quite frequently. Sure. But just just so you know, the, the dose for doxy and minocycline is the same. At full antibiotic levels, it's 100 mg twice a day. So that's 200 mg. And Dr. Nelson is saying just to, to, to for the mitohermesis, it's uh, 20 milligrams. Right. So it's one tenth the dose. Yeah, absolutely. But that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Well, they're more susceptible. You know, mitochondria and, and, and their, their linkage to alpha proteobacter is just, it's, it's just, well, again, the tetracyclines are modifying the communication of the mitochondria with the cell. Okay, they're exquisite immunomodulators that way. And it's just something that's come into light because, by the way, mitochondria researchers, they don't really talk to the infectious disease world too much. And that's a shame. And then the infectious disease world, they don't talk to chemists like me too much. But I stand in the middle and kind of bring these people together. And, and sometimes they get, you know, oh, I don't know if I believe that. Well, well too bad. Here's what the <laughs> molecules do, okay? So, you know, the proof is in the molecules and how the molecules affect um, um, what I call the tetracyclone. You've heard of proteome and the genome. Well, I, I'm creating the tetracyclone. Tetr different tetracyclines I'm not, I'm, have I'm going to be an honorary member. Yeah, <laughs> you, could, you can be the chairman. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, one, one thing I learned today, yeah. and Dr. Nelson, I'd love it if you come back tomorrow at 6 p.m. your time because there's so much rich information. I know we're going to get a lot of repeat customers just to try to absorb more of this. And please come with your questions as, as well, and we'll try to answer some, but we're running out of time now. But the most interesting thing I learned statins come from yeast, ivermectin comes from the soil. Tetracyclines came from the soil. Who would have thunk it? I didn't know that until today. And so I'm I'm really excited to go out and eat some dirt. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, you mentioned soil. I got to tell you this story because it's really cool. Okay, you ready? Yes. Can you, can you see a slide that says ancient history? Yep. All right. All right, folks. So years ago, this, this archaeologist from Emory found what he thought were, were uh, fluorescent bands in bone from an ancient tribe 2,000 years old in Nubia. And he started to study it, and he didn't know what it was. And so for years, he kept thinking it was tetracyclines. And the reason being is because the soil bacterium makes oxytetracycline. So these ancient Nubians and people in general have been fermenting beverages for 3,000 years. So the theory is, and this is from George, here's George right here. He passed away, by the way. I'm so sad. He's a great guy. He found these colored osteons that are reminiscent of tetracycline labeling in these ancient bones. And so when I met him in 2000, I, we had a Gordon conference called Non-Antibiotic Properties of Tetracyclines, and I invited George to give a talk. He showed up, and he was telling me all about it. And I said, well, George, send me some bones. I, I have an LC mass spec. I know how to do this. And I, I figured he was going to send me like, you know, a little ground up. He sent me like partial skulls and <laughs> hair stuck to it. I'm like, ah, I'm a chemist. And anyway, so I extracted the bones in anhydrous hydrogen fluoride, the most caustic chemical in the world. It's like alien blood from that movie Aliens. <laughs> anyway, it, 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 when we analyzed it, what we found was that these, these ancient tribe, the Nax tribe, had all kinds of tetracyclines in the bones. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the theory is, and by the way, the whole tribe was dosed with this. The, the bone that I analyzed was from a four-year-old. Uh, there was across the board, different age groups. The whole tribe was being dosed with this, this beer gruel. And the theory is that the soil bacterium got into the beer and turned it into a gold-colored, strawy-like, sinewy material. Now, if you were an ancient Nubian hanging around and, you, and your beer turned into gold, and this is Egypt, you know, wouldn't you think this, this was great? And so he, they dosed their whole tribe. 
Wow. So, yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. So I think we what, have an opportunity to create pubs. I'm telling you. you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. Actually, so I'm working with these, this young woman at Purdue to find a, a, a safer way because anhydrous hydrogen fluoride can kill you. <laughs> but, but in any case, we're trying to find a safer way to study like large populations in Nubia and in that peninsula area uh, uh, that, had, that were dosed with tetracyclines. And they didn't know it. But the amount of disease in their bones was much less. And that's what George studied. He studied, uh, he studied uh, disease incidents in ancient peoples. Anyway, that's my story. That's George. And uh, it's amazing. So, yeah. glad I, so, so glad by I the way, so, so here's the other uses of tetracycline. I don't know. I think I got some work cut out for me. I don't know where to go next. But, you know, I think, you know, ophthalmology shows up earlier than neurodegeneration. And, and Dr. Trump being an ophthalmologist, I think really a, the best place to go is um, with ophthalmology. But I will tell you, Dr. Carter, please turn off your mic, your, your speakers. <laughs> I brush my teeth with minocycline <laughs> three, three or four times a year. Oh, yeah. What I'll do is I'll do four treatments. When I'm done, I feel like I've been to a hygienist. All right. So you mentioned, you know, uh, so there's a company that I work with called Numedics that we're trying, and we use a compound that I developed for them called the tetracycline called NM320 in an ophthalmology model, a retinal pigment epithelial tissue sure. cell. And here we show that the compound stops uh, cell loss with hydrogen peroxide. So, hmm. you know, another use of tetracycline is ophthalmology. Yeah, well, minocycline is adequate. Oh, I bet. Keep no working at it, Mark. You'll, you'll come up with one better, but. Yeah, it's like I don't have enough to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll, well see you. Well, go ahead. No, no, does anybody have any questions? Let me know, and then you can write me anytime. I'm always open, and uh, well, I look forward to I'm talking more. What's, what's, your, what's your email, please, Dr. Nelson? You gave a great presentation. I'd want to ask about chlamydia maybe tomorrow night, but if you have time, I noticed oh. it on one of your slides. Uh, Having uh, an elevated count of what I should have, I just thought. At, uh, I'll send you my Gmail. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, listen, thank you all. And Tom, I'm happy to talk tomorrow night. Set me up again. That would be fantastic. I'll have Jody send you out the, just a slightly different link. Same deal. That sounds good. Amazing. Right, amazing presentation, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. It's really brilliant. Helpful. All right. Go get some pomegranate juice until I come up with a new drug. I'm going to <laughs> get some chocolate. I heard the word chocolate, so chocolate, more chocolate instead. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you. Peace. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.